Greetings and welcome to the Upper Pen Podcast. My name is Dakota and today I am talking with award-winning narrator Andrea Parsnell. Andrea has narrated such series, serieses as The Wandering Inn by Pirate Abba, Dominion of Blades by Matt Dineman, who will hopefully finish it one day, looking at you Matt, and Poitera Online by Don Chapman. She is funny and heart wrenching and awesome. Thank you for joining me, Andrea. Thank you for having me. That's awesome. Um, so how did you get started narrating? Um, I was, uh, it's kind of a weird story. I was uh, disabled. I have a, a spinal stenosis in my back and it crushed some, some nerves from my legs. So I was, I got so I couldn't walk or anything. And I was really kind of at a point where I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I couldn't sit in an office chair anymore. And I, I it kind of derailed everything that I had planned for what I was going to do. And so I had I had to reevaluate and I went back to school and started kind of I was in school for for vocal, like a classical music vocals and didn't find what I loved there it was just not right. And then I moved over to theater, like musical theater, and I can't dance to save my freaking life. So I couldn't make it in the theater program. And plus, I walked with a cane at the time, like really badly limping and stuff. So I. My leg didn't work right. Like it just was a, it was a mess. And my school was really great. They had great programs from disability, but that's asking a lot of them to like completely alter the program. So I kind of pivoted again and, and tried to figure out what, what I was going to do. And an author friend of mine, William D. Arend, who we had kind of met and become friends with through uh, Other Life, his, uh, one of his series, he basically was talking to me one day and he's like, well, why don't you try narration? And I said, what What are you talking about? And he said, why don't you try it? Just try it. And I said, but that's, that's like what, that's, that's professional voice actors. That's not me. That's not what I do. I, I'm an idiot. I don't, I don't do that thing. And he's like, no, 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 seriously. You, you, hold on, hold on. I'm going to send you something. And he sends me, he picks, he basically cherry picked the worst auditions he'd ever received for his books. And he sends them to me and he's like, these are professional narrators. And now I look back on that and I'm horrified that that was my motivation because it was like, oh, okay, don't measure yourself by others. Barometer, you know, don't, don't walk that path. It's, it's dark and it doesn't have anything good at the end of it. But for me, it was the right motivation at the time that it was an attainable goal. And so I started narrating and he offered me one of his series. He offered me Wild Wastes. And at the time, like he was he was just coming up and I was nobody, obviously. And I, I kind of I said, yeah, sure. I mean, if you're willing to take the risk, then I am. And so I did my first book and I made it to two weeks into the recording because it used to take me like six weeks to record a book it took forever and I was like two weeks into the recording of my very first book which was Falling Out of Focus by Bryn Myers and I was I was not doing well basically I was I hated how it sounded I couldn't get the sound right I was using a blue snowball mic it was a, I basically I had to reevaluate it just wasn't right and so I talked to my mom and my mom the champion that she is she we didn't she had no more money than I did but she financed she had credit and she financed me my whisper room so my sound booth was financed by my mom and I managed to get my school grant because I was making no money so I was getting grants to go to school and I had bought all of my books and stuff for discounts and I saved the rest of it and I bought an AT2035 mic. <laughs> People who are in the know know what I'm talking about. It's a really solid mic for like 150 bucks and you can get it with the interface for like, I think it was $200 at the time. I could get both of them. And so I got my my mic and my interface and I had my booth financed and this the foam came with it. Luckily, we paid a premium for it because you financed it. So heaven forbid you paid for that. But like we we got it all set up and I hit the ground running. And so I had this lease payment on the booth. So I had fire at my heels the entire time. I had to start making money. So I base I was just I started running and I never stopped because I had to get to the point where I was independent and I could pay for that booth payment. And I'm happy to say that booth was paid off a long time ago. <laughs> I've come a, I've come a ways from then and I, I it's been a long journey, but it's been awesome. <laughs> 
That's pretty fantastic. That's like a nice winding, wandering story. I know. <laughs> Most of them that I tell are. I apologize in advance. <laughs> no, I like it. Uh, part of the reason I do these is because I like to hear a lot about different people's lives and like how they got to where they're going and like people I enjoy, you know, and I really enjoy your work. So Thank I like you. to hear it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so how did you... How did you get into lit RPG? Because you do a lot of lit RPG now. I do, and that w it was one of the reasons that I started. I came up in lit RPG because I was a huge fan of the genre. I fell in love with it, and it all started with Sword Art. Like I'm one of the people that came from Sword Art. Some people came from Ready Player One. I came from Sword Art, and y'all say what you want. I love the series, and you can take a hike. Okay, I love it. And I've taken so much crap for that series over the years, but I loved it. And I, I love this, like this story of, of Kirito and Asuna and the, the story of them being trapped in this game. And Hayes found other life. That was that where it started. He found other life and basically went, babe, you have to hear this. You, you're not going to believe it. It's a book like SAO. And I said, are you kidding me? That's a thing? And he said, yes, it is a thing. And you have to hear the, the narrator. You have to hear the person who reads the audiobook because he does the best female voices that I've ever heard. And in case it's Jeff Hayes. So <laughs> he does have the best female voices outside of an actual, he, you know what? He has better female voices than some of mine are. Let's be honest about that. He has phenomenal female voices and voices in general. So he played it for me and I was like, this is amazing. And I fell in love with it. And I went continue online, ascend online, awaken online. Like I started binging the genre at that point. And when I was looking after I had the agreement for, for Wild Wastes, I was pouring through um, anybody who doesn't know, acx.com is where a lot of us get like our, our books from. At least when we start out, you build relationships with authors after that and kind of move off of the search functions on ACX, especially nowadays. It's, it's a little more hairy nowadays. There's a lot of scams out there, but I was pouring through ACX looking for something and I came across Dominion of Blades that was listed. And I was like, it's a lit RPG. It's a lit RPG on ACX. Oh my gosh. And I panicked and ran upstairs and I didn't audition right then. I think it was like, like eight at night, nine at night, something or other. I didn't audition and I poured over it and panicked and freaked out. And I was like, I just hope I can do it. I just hope I get it. And so I sent the, the audition in and I was, I can't remember where I was. It wasn't Facebook. I think it was Twitter. And I was like on, I it popped up on my screen because I'm not on Twitter very much, but it popped up on my screen and it was Matt Denneman who I had just finished searching his name on Twitter for obvious reasons. I, I basically popped up and said, just heard the most amazing audition. I can't remember it word for word, but it was like, I just heard the most amazing audition. Can't wait to hear how she does the rest of the book if she'll take it. And I was like, wait, wait, I just sent an audition. I sent an audition and maybe, and he sent, he sent me a message and said, this was amazing. I loved your audition. You were phenomenal. I'd love to work with you. And when I tell you my fat heart soared that day, I, my little tubby butt ran up the stairs limping and all and get, cause I, it's been a long journey to not be as gimpy as I used to be. I used to limp really hard and I could hardly walk and I couldn't sit in a chair like this. It's been a very long journey, but I got up the stairs and I ran down the hall to my mom and I was like, mom, 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 you're not going to believe this. And she's like, what? Hayes was at the store at this point. So I couldn't tell him. So I had to tell somebody. And I, she's like, what? And I said, I got the little RPG. I got to make a place. I was freaking out. And she's like, you're not, you're kidding me. You got it? And I said, yeah, I did. It's so cool. And I, I flipped out and I was celebrating. Hayes comes home and I'm beaming. And he's like, what's going on? I said, oh, I got the lit RPG. And it was my first time. Like that was my first lit RPG. And I, so my my first harem book and my first lit rpg came out right one after the other basically and i've been in both tracks ever since <laughs> they seem to cross pretty often too, they cross so. a lot yeah they cross a lot so it's it's an, it's a lot of fun and i i was really lucky so i got really fortunate and matt is amazing like and someday he'll get back to dominion of blades because papa misses you matt <laughs> <So funny. laughs> He, so when I interviewed him, he's like, yeah, I started writing Dungeon Crawler Carl when I should have been finishing the last one. And I was like, yeah, you did. You did. 
<laughs> it's understandable though. Dungeon Crawler Carl's amazing. So <laughs> I'm so, I'm so tattoo. jealous. It's, oh, it's <laughs> phenomenal. It's so good. I listened, I, I started listening to the first book like a month ago. I was really late to the party because I don't have a lot of time for listening anymore, even though you really need to make that a part of your, your track as a narrator. But I, I wasn't, I hadn't listened to anything and I picked up uh, Dungeon Crawler Carl on a on a walk, and I hear Jeff pop up, and he's like, "Yeah, I was uh, I broke up with my girlfriend," and I'm like, "He's doing warping!" I lost it. It was the greatest thing. I thought that was hilarious. So, <laughs> I I absolutely adored it. So it's amazing. Matt's writing is phenomenal. He is so funny, and Jeff's timing is perfect. So it was just it's a great series. <laughs> So I understand. I understand the lack of Dominion of Blades. Doesn't mean I don't resent it, but I understand it. <laughs> You're still going to be the one narrating it, right? When it comes out. Oh yeah, I have nothing. There's okay. nothing. Nothing stopping me from doing that one. I I really really okay. love that series. <laughs> I just enjoy his mix of comedy and really dark. Yeah. So yeah, that's he. That's good. He's a funny guy. Oh my gosh, I still laugh about the troll nipples every once in a while. Like I just be existing. <laughs> just living my life and then i'll think about troll nipples just just troll nipples and rubbing ointment on them and popper's disgusted face just like you know i've done a lot of screwed up <laughs> like i've done a lot of stuff jonah <laughs> that was messed up <laughs> oh it's the kind of stuff that just sticks with you it's so good it's so good <laughs> he does have a lot of really good Oh, gosh. But you made it better. You know, you, you have all these fun voices. <laughs> Thank um, you. So how do you get started with these voices? Like, you have so many. And, like, you <laughs> track of them. Uh, I keep track of them with uh, audio files because I am the worst and can't track anything memory wise. That's asking a goldfish to do calculus. Don't do it. So I just track everything in a, in a studio. One uses song files. So I just have multiple tracks in there. And when you, <laughs> when you get a book like wandering in that file run real slow, that file run real, real slow. I got to figure out how to split it. And there, there's a, there's another series, Aether's revival that I do that has the same issue by Daniel Genovan that, that so many characters and I open up the character file and my computer just starts chugging and I'm like, okay, guys, can we calm down <laughs> because I can't remember them without keeping them. All right. So I, I keep track of them that way. And as far as how I come up with them, um, I think the key is having zero shame and very little fear of sounding really stupid and being committed to making a character come alive and not living in the world of caricature completely. If you have an understanding that some people edge toward caricature and you just use that sometimes, I think that's incredibly fun. But I, I struggle when it comes to like making super hyper realistic people. If I was doing, you know, nonfiction or, you know, more trad, like trad fiction, I, I don't know the other word for it, like where it's like just traditional fiction, where it's just a book, you know, if I was doing that where you just had standard everyday people, I would probably have a lot harder time with that because I, I tend to edge toward like the anime vibe of voices and stuff like that. So, but I, I like it. I like the kind of heightened emotion and, and heightened characters and getting to make these voices that I've I grew up I grew up hearing and respecting and I'm a role player, so all my D and D characters and stuff and, and my Shadowrun characters, they all have these weird voices, so why not carry it over into work? And I worship Matt Mercer, so I just I live in in that world, so why not carry it over into what I do? That makes sense. And for um when I first started listening to The Wandering Inn. I was not sure that I liked Erin because <laughs> she's so whiny in that first book, you know? She, is, she has and some moments, you, yeah. You capture her too well. <laughs> I have heard that so many times. Like, so many times people are like, I couldn't make it through the first book because the narrator just, as weird as it sounds, the narrator did too good of a job. And I'm like, I don't know how I feel about that because I feel bad. But at the same time, that's how she sounds to me. <laughs> But it's well, true. She has a rough go. She has a rough go of it at the beginning, for sure. But she she wears in, you know, like mm -hmm. everything. But as soon as I met the other characters, I was like, okay, I'm down. You know, I'll have other people populating yeah. the world. Yeah. Um, 
do you did you ever find like that you have those extreme reactions or like how you deal with those people who have such extreme reactions to specifically the wandering in like it oh. seems like that one in general <laughs> oh man i can honestly say wandering in is is probably one of the biggest reasons that i've had to to pull back a little bit from like facebook and stuff because Oh, I've been a part of it. Like I was, I was a fan of lit RPG before I started narrating in it. So I've been a part of these groups since like 2015, you know? So I've, it's either 2015 or 2016. Somebody is going to fact check that and call my BS if I'm wrong. So whatever the right answer is, it's that. Um, but I've, I've been a part of these groups for so long. I know people, I'm, I'm part of the community and I, it is, it is hard to describe the kind of unique hurt when somebody puts up a post that's like really long and, and detailed about how crappy the narration is or how horrible this book is and how the narrator just made it worse, you know, and yada, yada, yada. And you're sitting there going, I'm here. <laughs> I've been here for a long time. I'm sorry. You know, it's taken me a long time to kind of get past it and move to the point of like, if if somebody just doesn't like my portrayal, it's taken me a while, but I'm at the point where whether you like her or not, Aaron sounds like this to me and it's never going to be any different. And unfortunately, you can suck it if you have a problem because that's what she sounds like. And it's taken a long time and a, lo a lot of tears to build that confidence, but it's finally there and no one's going to ruin that for me. So that's kind of where I am, where it's like, no, no, I, I, I feel I make the best choice that I can at the time. I do what I feel. I always give 150% to every book that I do. I work really hard on them to make sure that I'm fairly representing the work and, and bringing it to life the best way I know how. So instead of trying to pull my confidence from what other people thought and, and how my work was being re received, I had to learn to kind of find my own confidence in how I portrayed things and just rest comfortably in that. That said, still a human, still cut and bleed. So I don't I don't go on Facebook as much anymore because as, as your name kind of grows and kind of moves further and further, you become less and less of a person and more and more of a name. Like it, it just gets harder and harder. So people talk more and more like you're not in the room. And unfortunately, I'm a sensitive flower to an extent. So I do my best. People have preferences. I'm never going to fault them for just having preferences. Sometimes I understand I'm a strong personality. I am Erin. She is my spirit animal. I am, I am all over the place. I get it. So everyone's got preferences. It's all about learning to live with yourself. <laughs> You're much stronger than me because I'm like in dread of the moment somebody leaves that <laughs> awful YouTube comment and I'm like, come on. <laughs> You don't have to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's rough for sure. And you just all you can do is is walk away knowing that whether or not somebody else understood it, you know, you spoke your truth. So I feel like it happens more often to women narrators, too, that they get these weird nitpicky like you don't sound good to me. Um, I don't listen I, to female narrators. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And. I already don't have enough female narrators in like the lit RPG genre. If you start eliminating them, I'm going to be very upset. It's taken so long to be able to break into it. Like I, I, I was, I fought so hard at the beginning for every female role I could find. I, I, I looked so hard and wanted it so bad. And I got, so I started narrating male led books because I refused to be kind of, gate kept out of it because there were no female characters. I found the female characters there were, and then I just needed to do other stuff too. So it's, it's definitely tough. And it's, people are, are, there was a lot of wars at the beginning. It's really kind of gotten better over the years. Like it, it really has, the community has grown a whole lot. Everyone's, you know, if you, if you say that kind of crap now, most people will talk you down. Most people will call you down for it. But at the beginning, it was very, very common to hear things like, I don't listen to female narrators. I have a wife at home that I have to listen to. Why do I have to listen to another woman for 10 hours? And that's a that's a unique kind of hurt. You know, that's a unique kind of like you're just you're not insulting my skill or my talent or my my ability. You're you're 
criticizing my ovaries. And I don't even understand that. You're just criticizing my gender. So especially for somebody that doesn't sound like a Disney princess. And even if I did, what's wrong with that? You know, you don't hear that a lot. You don't, you don't hear real often. I don't listen to male narrators. And that's usually my frustration is the fact that like, I don't have a problem with somebody who has like an issue with specific narrators, but if you lump all narrators together by gender, you're probably just a dick like that. You're probably rude. Like that's the reality. <laughs> Let treat each people person individually. That's the key. <laughs> so what I don't get is like lit RPG is pretty progressive. Like it has, mm -hmm. It has LGBT characters, it has female characters, it has non-binary characters, like it has characters, but people just seem like the narrators, man, yeah. women narrators. <laughs> yeah, and to be fair, it's taken a really long time to get the representation that it has. When I first started out, there was very little, and I like I, I wanted to make sure that I gave voice to the characters that I could that were on, you know, in the LB, LGBTQ community and, and do those characters fairly and give them the audiobooks that I felt they deserved. And it it was frustrating at the beginning, but now it's come so far. Like the, it's just so much different. There's so much more. It still has a ways to go, but for some reason that hang up still exists. And I think it's because of this. I think it's because you're you're in front of that microphone for 10 hours, 12 hours, 15 hours. And if you do have some sort of like deep prejudice or if you do have something that bothers you, um, you're not it's going to be tough to fight that for 12 or 15 hours. And so as long as you're not a jerk about it online, everybody has the stuff that they deal with. You know, if you just can't deal with the vocal type, you do you boo boo. I ain't going to I'm not going to be mad at you about it, but if you're a douche about it online, then I'm probably, I'm probably going to be annoyed at you. <laughs> but yeah, it didn't start out that way, but it got it got better. And it still seems to be a bit of a hang up over female narrators, but it's OK. It's come a long way. <laughs> I tend to not read negative reviews at all um, because I just generally don't like what they have to say. Or it's like it was a woman or it was too <laughs> short. And like 12 hours isn't too short. <laughs> Yeah, that's a hard one when people are like, it's not worth a credit. It's only 10 hours. It's not worth a credit. It's only 15 hours. It's a good, there are really, really good books that are eight hours long. There are really, really good books that are 10 hours long. You can put a whole lot of filler in there to make it a 20 hour book just to try to get a, an extra dollar because you want to get into the next tier of cost on Audible because it costs more money the higher up you go. Like the the credits are the are worth the same, but the uh, ALP or whatever it is cost the out of pocket cost is goes up the higher the hour count. So there are there are people authors and stuff not necessarily it's not I haven't seen it in lit RPG but they do exist out there that shoot for filler so that they can shoot for the higher amount of an audiobook. But I don't think that's the answer. I don't think time is the answer. I think quality is the answer. But it's hard to convince people of that, so it's okay. <laughs> Well, there's so much of it right now, like so much lit RPG, and a lot of it's not being edited how I would expect a like published book to have been edited anyway. So like adding filler to that is just like, uh, I'm yeah, it gets rough. And there's there's such a push in lit RPG because it is such a current genre. There's a real push on authors and pressure on authors from listeners and readers for the next book, the next book, the next book. So I find it. I, I can't blame authors necessarily for when editing comes up as an issue and stuff because yeah. they are they are slamming as hard as they can to try to keep up. But it is it is nuts. The the second a book comes out, the next day they're getting messages. Where's the next one? Where's the next one? And these are the same people that waited five years for a Sanderson book, but they want this one tomorrow, now, now, yesterday. You should have it already written. And it's it's so flattering on one hand because it's like, oh, they love my stuff. It's awesome. This is the greatest. And on the other hand, it's socially crushing because it's like you you are never going to catch up. You're never good enough because so many authors suffer with imposter syndrome and stuff. They suffer with their own forms of depression and, and their own neurodivergences where it's just so difficult. And having 100 people a day tell them, hey, you really shouldn't be playing around. You should be writing. You know, that seems like a joke the first time. It seems like a joke the second time. By the fifth time you've heard it in the same day, it starts to feel like a message and it starts to pressure. So I don't, I don't, I go easy on the authors in the genre when it comes to like mistakes or 
typos or, or editing issues purely because of that. Man, it gets rough. So I can't blame them. But I can't blame fans for wanting the stuff either. That's a compliment. So, and nobody ever means anything negative by it, ever. It's always just love. It's always just like, I want the next thing. No one understands that it's it's a lot of pressure, but I don't know an author that would like it to stop either because that means that they, no one's reading their stuff. So keep doing it. Just have have people's you know hearts in mind. <laughs> Do you get the same kind of feedback from people? Like, why hasn't your book come out yet? Oh, yeah, especially with as backed up as I am. I... I I work on a lot of really amazing series that have rabid fan bases that love the audiobooks. And I could not, I could not be more honored to be a part of that camp. I, I couldn't, it would, it is absolutely phenomenal. I, I am humbled every day I get to go to work because I get my, I am, I'm living my dream job. But on the same hand, when I, when I open up my messages and it's, where's this one? Why aren't you working on this one? well, why is this one not out? And it's like, why can't you just do all of these and then they'll be done and then you can work on other stuff. And it's so hard to convince people that, you know, for every person that messages me about why don't I just do the wandering in and screw everything else? I've got other people messaging me. Why don't I just do Aethers? Why don't I just do Binding Words? Why don't I just do Wild Waste? Why don't I just do, you know, why don't I just do, just do, just do, and don't do anything else? Because everybody has the thing they love. So I rotate, I schedule, you know, I, I do what I can to get everything out faster. But unfortunately, I am one person. So I do get the same messages. I don't get as many as authors do, for sure. Like, I, I definitely don't. And most <laughs> most of my authors are viciously protective. So they will tell their fans not to do that because I have I, they're really awesome. But I don't I don't blame people for it. But it, we do get the same pressure for the most part. Do you also do your own like editing or your own? OK, because that's like so much extra. Yeah, no. Yeah, no, 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 no. I I didn't, I haven't done my own editing since Dominion of Blades. Like Dominion of Blades was the last book that I edited myself and it took me so long. Uh, it, it was, I am not an editor. Uh, I learned real early on, I am better off uh, finding somebody that I can pay to do that. Or my mom was my editor for the longest time. Like my mom was in sound for 30 plus, 40 plus years. And she was like, hey, let me do it. I'll, I'll edit your stuff. She does a phenomenal job. The lion's share of my books have been edited by my mom. So she's phenomenal. She's, uh, she's undergoing chemo right now. So she's not editing my stuff right now, but she's doing okay. She's doing okay. Just long journey. But it's basically, I, I haven't edited my stuff because I'm not good enough at it. So now I have, I have editors that I, that I work with now to kind of keep everything moving. Because I record about two finished hours a day. And that takes me about six to seven hours, depending on like how smoothly things go. Sometimes it's not that smooth. But if I were to do that and then also try to edit, I would never make it. So Fortunately, I'm I'm able to put out enough audio that I can keep up, at least for the most part, but I couldn't throw editing in there. <laughs> Plus, the quality would tank. <laughs> you do not want me editing my own stuff. <laughs> That's not my specialty. I know enough to get in trouble. I definitely pay attention to the interviews, and I only edit the parts that I remember are not great. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm like, ugh, it's there fine. It's raw, right? It's... <laughs> That's authentic. <laughs> it's true, especially in podcasts and stuff. It works really well to have that kind of authentic kind of back and forth vibe. So it plays really well in these. <laughs> Good. I'm not just lazy. <laughs> you just have to bank on someone not going crazy Nazi in the middle of the interview. Like as long as you can steer clear of that, you're good. <laughs> that interview just doesn't get posted, you know? <laughs> Those aren't my days. That's a good idea. <laughs> um, so... If your mom was your narrator and you did all these harem novels, was it awkward? <laughs> yes. My mom, my mom was my editor for Wild Wastes. Uh, and I'm going to try to figure out how to censor this. But she, uh, she, I was walking down the hallway and in Wild Wastes, it is an explicit series. And not all harem is, contrary to popular belief, not all harem is explicit. So I, I have to put that out there. A lot of people think it is. This one specifically is. Um, and there is somebody in that in there that is a soldier aunt, uh, is one of the girls in the harem. And I am walking down the hallway of our house. 
and my husband and I lived in the basement. My mom lived on the top floor. Yes, I lived in my mother's basement for a really long time. We bought a house together. Shush. So I was walking down the, the hallway upstairs, and all I hear is, Are you kidding me? He screws an ant? <laughs> And I just went, oh, she got to Petra. <laughs> so, yeah, we had some moments. My mom is the best sport about things. My mom is such a good sport. My mom, uh, and, you know, when you know who she is, it makes it funnier because she's like, she was a worship leader for 30 years. Like, she's, she is a God-fearing Christian woman, but she is very much also on the camp of, this is your job. It's not who you are. It doesn't matter. And God loves you either way. It doesn't matter. So you, let, ye, let ye without sin cast the first stone. My mom is very much in that camp. So she was always a really good sport. She was awesome. But yes, extremely awkward. Circling back. Yes, very <laughs> awkward at first. <laughs> she got used to it, I think. I read a really funny Twitter post of a romance writer and she's like, I told my mom not to read this part because it has like explicit sex scenes. And then my grandma came back and told me that's not very explicit. And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's pretty <really> good. <laughs> I guess your grandma didn't have a lot to do when she was a kid. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Grandma's got a spicy life. Don't judge grandma. I mean, ain't vanilla. <laughs> now I just always wonder what it's like. Like, how do you explain those moments of like, yes, he had sex with an ant. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> you just don't. You just. You just. You just. You just move on. Like, <laughs> like you process it. You have the laugh about it because it's objectively hilarious. So you have the laugh about it, and then you just kind of move on. And it's like it's work. It doesn't matter. Like you just you just go on with your day, and it's all good. <laughs> there are still moments that she'll call me or she'll text me every once in a while. Like it's not lately, but before, she would still text me and go, "Serious, seriously, Andy." Seriously. Really? Really? Why? That's all I want to know is why. And I'm like, what you, did you did you get to so and so? And she's like, I I got there, surpassed it, and still had a problem, Andy. What is going on? And I'm like, okay, so you may not that this is what happens later. It makes it make sense, I promise. <laughs> she, she's still she'll every once in a while she'll be like, I don't know what's happening in this, but it's terrifying. <laughs> But she's a great sport. <laughs> That's pretty magical. <laughs> it really it really is. It's one of the funnier things. When people know my mom was my editor for all of my books for a long time, they're like, wait, even? Yeah, even. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep. <laughs> she spent a lot of time on those ones, I bet. <laughs> yeah, she did. Because they were early and she was still learning how to do it, too. So it took a long time. <laughs> Poor thing. Oh. I swear I put that woman through hell. <laughs> Oh, clearly she loves you though, you know? <laughs> I have a I have a great mom. She does love me. I'm very, very fortunate. She she financed my booth. She edited my books. I couldn't ask for a more supportive mom. She's been incredible. <laughs> very spoiled. So do you contract with Podium or are you independent and you happen to work for them every now and again? Um, it's kind of both. We the all of all of basically all of a narrator's projects for the most part, they're all by contract for each book. So I am I'm what's called a podium partner. So I am I'm a partner with podium, which basically means that I have uh, a contract with them that I'll do like a certain amount of hours with them and stuff, which is basically the wandering in. So <laughs> those books are so long. <laughs> so um, but I, I'm in their podium partnership program. They have been awesome to me. I absolutely love po love podium, but I'm also fiercely, fiercely independent. I never wanted anybody to own me. I never wanted anybody to have too much power over me because I always wanted to be able to, if if I had to, to be able to walk away or to be able to do more or be able to do something different. Or ultimately at first it was because I was afraid something might happen. I was, I was really afraid that my back was gonna go out and I wasn't gonna be able to walk again. And I was so scared of over investing and, and putting all of my eggs in one basket and then that basket leaving me. So I was terrified of that. 
So I, I have diversified. I'm very fiercely independent and, but I love working with the people. I'm so fortunate. Like I, I love working with the people that I get to work with and I, I, it's been a blast. So yeah, I'm a, con I'm contracted with everything, but I am in contract essentially. So it's a unique situation. So how does the financials work? I guess, do you get royalties on audiobooks? Uh, it depends on the setup. It's all very okay. individual. Um, it's uh, through po anything through Podium for me, at least it's all individually like negotiated with different people. For me, anything through Podium is n none of it's going to be royalty like that's all paid per hour or per finished hour and it's done. Um, there are some projects that I work on ACX on an independent basis that I am royalty share with like and I've been that way with those authors since the beginning. We're we're audio partners. We have been for the longest time, you know, but otherwise it's it just kind of goes in between those two there is an in between with athon yeah that's athon athon is another publisher and they kind of do both like they do like they'll pay an upfront and then they'll also do royalty and they were awesome too so it's it's kind of different depending on each contract everybody has very very different opinions on whether or not a narrator deserves a cut of the sales whether or not a narrator should have a cut of the sales whether or not a narrator should even be paid a fair rate like there's a lot of opinions so kind of depends on who you're working with and stuff a it's, fair rate yeah there are a lot of people out there who want to pay narrators 50 dollars per finished hour which is not per hour a lot of people think that's per hour it is not per hours per finished hour that is editing proofing uh if you had to sing a song and you had to write the lyrics or the, the music or whatever you needed to do uh however long it took you to record it all of that has to be bundled up in that one hour of audio like that's all what you get paid for so it's good to be efficient but don't no, not efficient at the cost of quality basically well, that's kind of bonkers to me because that doesn't even take into account the amount of time that you have to spend prepping or like yeah reading the material and with the wandering in that's forever <laughs> oh, it takes me so long i'm a slow reader it's the worst <laughs> i'm a slow reader me my reading ability is the worst i i am so slow so i still to this day usually take like two days to prep a book and there are narrators out there that would just vomit hearing that because that's so long for them but for me it's that's what it takes me but I try to compensate for it in the fact that I'm able to consistently, I work six days a week and I turn out usually if I'm able to two hours a day. So I try to compensate that way, but I do my best. <laughs> two <laughs> finished day. hours a day. Yeah. 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 Two finished hours a day. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think people always understand that, that it's like the number of hours that you put into a book is like three or four times longer than at yeah. least. It is, and there's there's stuff that comes along with it. Like there's stupid things that can happen. Uh, if you have a voice that's really, really taxing, especially if you do like really heavily differentiated characters. Like for me, Floss is one of those voices where in book four, I wanna say it's four, where um, Floss, the King of Destruction, ends up with this like 11 hour stretch of all his story. Uh, that knocked me out for like two days because it was just so much yelling as as floss and stuff. That'll do it. Um, really heavy, like reiki, whispery voices can do it sometimes. But I will get laryngitis just from like doing stuff like that, from from doing stupid things. And I try to be very careful. I've been, I kind of changed a little bit as to how I do characters over the years just for longevity's sake. I don't make as extreme choices. I still make really extreme choices, but I try to keep it at least within a certain range. Like if I know how long that person's going to talk, if I know how much dialogue they're going to have, that kind of stuff. I try to try to keep those things in mind now just for my own sake. But I still will end up with stupid stuff. Like I, I get hormonal laryngitis, like I just dumb stuff that comes up that you're like, oh, cool. Now I can't record for three days. Awesome. Perfect. That was in my schedule and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> and there's just kind of a it's an issue. So, yeah, <laughs> I couldn't imagine doing it because I get hay fever every year in the spring yeah. and fall. Like, yeah. I just, I'm yeah. lazy. It's just going to yeah, I live off Benadryl. Yeah, it's I take Benadryl every morning. It's the one thing that I found that works. I tried Flonase, uh, 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 what's not Alexa, not Alexa, <laughs> Effexor? Allegra. Thank you. That's yeah. one. I was like, not Effexor. That's an antidepressant. I think no, Allegra. <laughs> That's the one I'm thinking of. Uh, Allegra, 
uh, fexafenidine, I think is a, the generic for Allegra. What's the Claritin one? I tried Claritin. I, I've tried so many of them. Benadryl in the morning works. That keeps me at least drained and clear and I can keep talking, but I have, I have really bad allergies too, especially right and this time of year is terrible. Well, I got COVID and I honestly thought it was uh, allergies because it's that time of year and I was like, oh, it's, you know, it's just really bad allergies. I'm year. so sorry. <laughs> well, Multiple it's... levels. I'm so sorry. It's fine. <laughs> we all made it through. <laughs> as long as you survived. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, well, me and my boyfriend had it at the same time. So it was like, do I smother him in his sleep for my sanity or, um, you know, what do we do? <laughs> It's true. Yeah, it's my husband. My husband was disabled when I met him and he's a, he writes and stuff now, but he uh, he was disabled when I met him and then I got disabled and we were very fortunate that we got along as well as we did because we were suddenly together a whole lot all the time. And now I work from home. So other than the fact that I'm in a padded box for, you know, eight hours a day, other than that, he still has to see me, you know, <laughs> all the time. He never gets away. <laughs> He's stuck. <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lot to deal with. So he's, <laughs> He's a saint. Like he, he is absolutely a saint because the the insanity that you see before you is continuous. That is a walking hurricane all the time. And he is he is amazing. And for putting up with the, you know, the books that I do and some of the content that those books have and some of the reactions that that can provoke, he uh, he's been a trooper through all of it. He's very much he finds it hilarious. So <laughs> he's been great. Well, you've got it. How can you not? You know? Yeah. He's amazing. And we have a podcast every Saturday. We we don't do podcast podcasts. I say podcast because it's our Discord cast. Like we have our Saturday morning McGee's Discord cast. Eventually we will be actually doing like releasing it to real podcast places, but that's not where we are right now. So, but it's just role playing and stuff like that. And I think having that that day a week that we hang out and talk to the fans and like and to discuss topics that he's really knowledgeable on and I'm not as much. And, you know, the podcast is really his baby. I think that helped ground it a lot too, because we worked together and I, and he got brought into all of this. So he's not an outsider. He's a part of it. And I think that's really helped kind of in dealing with everything. He's, he's amazing. I'm very fortunate. So one more question back to how contracts yeah. work. How do you decide how much to charge for a book? Because you've been doing this for a while. You're pretty established now. Yeah, it's tough. I have kept my independent rate lower for working with individual authors, like independently with authors, because I wanted to stay in, in the realm of like reasonable for people to be able to afford it. Um, I have different rates with publishers and stuff, and all of those are like negotiated individually. But for when I work with individuals and when I work with people face to face, I tend to use like a lower rate because it's, I want I want people to be able to afford audio, but at the same time, I I can't I can't disregard the fact that like I I do need to make a certain amount to make it so I can still keep doing what I'm doing, you know. But yeah, it's it's been interesting kind of growing with it and changing. My rate hasn't changed for like two and a half years. I've I've kept it the same. I didn't want to raise it. I just kind of locked it where it was and I just turned people down. Essentially, if I if I don't have time, I just turn people down. Some people need to raise their rate to kind of filter people out because it does get to be overwhelming. So I've I've just basically gotten better at saying no. I had a problem saying no for a long time, but I've gotten better about it. I just am smarter and my rate hasn't changed for a long time in that sense and I, I like to keep it that way. But I started out at 225, 225. Union minimum is 250. So that's the number that a lot of people use is 250 per finished hour is the like SAG after minimum okay. rate. So, and that's supposed to be before editing. Like that's supposed to be prior to editing. So if you add on 75 per finished hour for editing, then you end up right around 325. And I'm between 325 and 350. So I basically kept my rate at union minimum plus my editing cost. So that's where I have kept it. I started out a little bit lower, but I just didn't want to keep raising it. I, it's too expensive. So I just, I kept it kind of in the same realm, but 
it's a it's a tough it's a tough thing and i'm not saying i'm not saying that's the right way to do it i'm not saying that anybody who raises their rate is wrong i don't know what the answer is that's just the path i took so i don't know that that's right or wrong but it's tough it's extremely tough I have done books for 170 bucks per finished hour. I've done books for royalty share, which is nothing unless they sell and make money. You know, I I never wanted cost to be a barrier to working with me. I wanted my availability and whether or not I can do the book to be the barrier, not my cost. It's just I don't want that to be the hurdle. I I just want new narrators to like know that there is a basic minimum because there is A S A X. ACX. I know. <laughs> you got there. ACX. Um, you can get royally ripped off. Yeah, you can. You get 50, no 50 bucks per finished hour. Yeah. Yeah. There's just no oversight, really. Um, so it's always one of those questions like, how how do you manage this? Because it's such a weird, yeah. I, don't, I don't like to talk about money. I'm very... I live in the northern Midwest. <laughs> like, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I it's it's hotly contested. It's yeah. extremely uncomfortable. And I am I'm I tend to get caught up in like how my words will affect other people. Like I tend to get really, really caught up in that. And I used to say, you know, like I don't do this for the money. Money isn't the reason, you know, yada yada yada. That's not why I'm in this. And then somebody goes, somebody who was in my real life said, that's kind of a privileged thing to say. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, it's a luxury to not have to worry about the money. You know, that's because your bills are paid. Somebody who's not paying their bills. And I'm like, I had no money when I started this. What are you talking about? I'm, I, what do you mean? And they're like, yeah, I get it. But that doesn't have the same ring when you are making money. And I'm like, oh, but I just never, I never thought about it. Like I didn't get into it for the money. I wasn't making anything at first and I was disabled and had no income. Like, what do you mean? I don't, what, what do you mean? <laughs> and I had this whole crisis, crisis of conscience over it. And I realized like, you know, you have to take time to kind of check your own privilege. And I realized, oh man, saying that's probably a dicky thing to say, isn't it? So now I've kind of come back around to, you know, it's, I'm privileged enough that I don't have to have my focus be on money, but I understand still, you know, it's, I am, I'm very happy that my bills are paid, but at the same time, I don't want people to not be able to afford to work with me. However, the idea, the the minimum rate argument, getting onto like the topic of, of ad, in narrators in general, uh, the minimum rate argument is a hotly contested topic. Like that is very hot. There are some narrators that are, you have no right to dictate to me what I'm going to charge. I am going to charge what I need to to work and you can take a hike. And you know, there's a lot of narrators that I, I am kind of in the camp of where rising tide raises all boats. You know, if you charge less, then that author will never understand that that is not a fair rate to pay someone. You need to pay them more because this is a lot of work. But at the same time, it's it's real hard. And I can't say much because I was kind of the same way when I started. Like when I started, I knew what I was doing. I was sure I was right. I thought everybody was jerks. I thought everyone was conceited and they were over the top. And how dare they talk to people like that? And if you don't continue to ev read your reviews, you're a monster. Guess who doesn't read all their reviews anymore? Because they grew up and realized I was wrong. <laughs> like That's the reality. The more you do something, the, re the more you realize you're an idiot, you know, stay open. If you think you're not wrong, if you think you are the hottest stuff that's existed, you probably need to check yourself because you're probably just like me and are going to look back at that and go, oh, that was bad. That was real rough. That, that makes you rough. such a smart person, though, that you can look back and be like, oh, yeah, that's kind of dumb. Yeah. I try. I try. <laughs> I find I find being an evolving human is better than being a human that just thinks they're real smart. So I, I try. I'd rather acknowledge myself being an idiot and move forward. <laughs> My default state is, you know, dummy. So it's Maybe. fine. High fives. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are you working on next? Are you working on more series or working on anything new? Uh, currently, I am working. I just wrapped up uh, Tower of Somnus 2, and the this one's not it's not out completely yet. It is available online. It's a web serial that's out. 
Um, it is such a fun series. It's so, so fun. I'm so excited for everybody to get to hear it because it's an absolute blast. Uh, but Tower of Somnus is what uh, the second book I just wrapped up. Uh, Wandering in Seven is in the can and recorded. Um, the I'm working now on Lux Voice 3 by Daniel Schinhofen. So, which is like a weird West fantasy thing that's super fun. <laughs> I love it. It's a it's a harem book that's just a just a slice of life joy. I love it. It's it's poker and magic and all kinds of stuff. It's like Doc Holiday with magic. I love it. <laughs> that's pretty magical, you know. Right. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, it's it's really cool. I'm I get to work on really fun books. I'm I just I'm very fortunate. <laughs> Do you ever look back at how much time you've spent on a series and been like, oh, my God, that's like two years. <laughs> oh, man, it's nuts. Like when I think about the first Wandering In book or I think about the beginning of the Sovereign Verse with William D'Aaron, like it's this overarching mega story with all these t- like smaller books or like um, smaller books. They are all 14 hour books, but they're smaller trilogies basically that stack up into this mega, mega universe or like, uh, Somnia where it's, it's my first true, like completed series. That was only me, you know, like Poitera was the first true completed series, but there were other narrators involved in Poitera with Somnia. It's all me all the way through. And it's a full story completed from beginning to end. You know, you, you, there's these weird milestones of like, Oh my gosh. I, I remember the first time I, I got one of my books that I had narrated and I looked at it and I picked it up and it was a full book and something about picking that book up and going, I read all these words out loud. Holy crap. Like it was so weird because it's. The same feeling that people go where they're like, oh, man, you read the whole book out loud. Yeah, we still feel that way a lot of times. Like, it's still weird. I go through it and I lose track because it's all on my iPad and I just scroll through when I'm narrating. But then I go back and I look and I like, pick up a copy of something and go, this has 2,200 pages in it. Like the first, the second wandering in book, I think was 2,200 pages or something like that. It was insane. And I, I look at that now and I'm like, man, that was a long book. That was a real long book. I'm really glad they started cutting those down into smaller chunks because it made it much more regulated in how they needed to be released. It was it got much easier for me to like consistently get them out. Whereas before I was actually having to like, can we please like give me a month break in here? Because these take me like two months to record. They're taking forever and I'm lo- falling behind on everything else. So That combination kind of with moving into sequels and sequels don't have the same juggernaut status as the first book does. I think it became more viable to make them a little bit smaller. So it was viable for recording and I think more viable for like cost reasons more than likely. Those are podium decisions that I don't know about, but that's my general assumption just by knowing how math works. (laughs) It seems like it'd be more reasonable. (laughs) You are already two steps ahead of me. I don't know how math works. It is a (laughs) history. It's it's my favorite thing to know nothing about. (laughs) Well, thank you, Andrea, for joining me today. Thank you, Dakota. This has been so much fun. I suggest that you browse Andrea's narrations because chances are there is a story you love in her catalog. I promise. Um, As always, thanks for listening and have a great day.